They ruin the experiment. Hey, maybe that's what happened to Connor's collaborators. They've been adding turtles to their RRDE experiments. Welcome to the Electrochemistry Podcast, where we discuss all things electrochemistry. I'm your host, Dr. Alex Paroff, and with me is my co-host, Dr. Neil Spinner. On today's podcast, we are going to hear about Connor, who developed an experimental oxygen reduction reaction electrocatalyst using encapsulated iron nanoparticles in carbon nanotubes. Developing non-precious metal electrocatalysts is no easy task, and Connor has spent several years developing his electrocatalyst that has finally made some headway. So much so that his advisor wanted to start collaborating with other labs to do more characterization and development of the catalyst. Now, Connor had been perfecting his thin film deposition process for prepping his catalyst on a rotating disc, rotating ring disc electrode. It was part science and part arts and crafts. Connor had spent a week in a collaborator's lab teaching them his methodology for synthesis, thin film preparation, and rotating ring disc experiments. And by the time the week was over, his collaborators were in good shape to do the research independently. A few weeks had gone by and the collaboration was going well. Initial results seemed to correlate fairly accurately between Connor's lab and the collaborator's data. However, about a month into this collaboration, data from RRDE studies began to diverge. Connor was getting reasonable results with his electric catalyst current density, rocks from reduction, but his collaborators were getting a value about 63% higher than his. This is a pretty big difference. There, they compared the percent weight of the catalyst, the instrument settings, solution conditions, how the calculation was performed, and while they found minor differences that are to be expected from one experiment to another, nothing explained the massive difference between measured current densities. So what is going on between Connor and his collaborators? Well, what's going on here is too many cooks in the kitchen. And, uh, you know, why would you ever want to collaborate? It just sounds awful. You know what they say about PhDs? Well, to be fair, I think they probably say a lot of things about PhDs. But in particular, we, we have this one that we actually say around our office is that if you ask three PhDs a question, you get four opinions. So if Connor just stops all of this collaboration nonsense, I bet he immediately graduates with honors. What was, uh, what was your experience doing collaborations in graduate school? No, oh, I just, I didn't. That's why I finished in two years with 57 publications, uh, an H index of 904, and an honorary <laughs> degree from 16 different countries. You're a regular prodigy. Yeah, if only. <laughs> yeah, everything I just said is a complete lie, in case it you know wasn't obvious from the fact that, well, it's, it's physically impossible to have an H index greater than your number of publications, and I also also did not have 57 of them. But in all seriousness, I did have a couple of stints of like attempted collaboration when I was in grad school. Um, and, you know, while neither were really like, like damaging, I guess, neither of them really went anywhere either. So at best, I personally just kind of found it mostly useless. Yeah, I, uh, I went to Northwestern for graduate school and the chemistry department really like they really pride themselves on collaborations. So most of my colleagues, including myself, were co-advised and tried to combine research efforts across different research groups. I would say most of the time, students and their research tended to lean more to one PI's research than another. I rarely saw projects that had like a 50-50 combination of like two different research groups. So what you're saying is that Northwestern science departments are basically just like a bunch of like gigantic transformers, amalgam robots that are made up of a bunch of different sciencey research topics. Are, are you a giant robot? Are you going to shoot lasers at me? Well, that that that's mostly correct, except about the giant robots. It's more like nano robots. Northwestern was the kingdom of nano, if there if there ever was one. Man, if if I ever heard a science buzzword thrown around, it was nano. You know, kingdom of nano sounds like the alternate name for like that school in the movie Zoolander. If you remember, where Ben Stiller's character, he's looking at this like model of a school. It's called the Center for Kids Who Can't Read Good and Who Want to Learn to Do Other Stuff Good Too. And then he says, like, how can the kids go to school if they can't even fit through the door? So tell me, Alex, how can anybody even go to Northwestern Nano School when they can't even fit inside the building? Wait a minute. Are you referring to 2001 American comedy film Zoolander starring and directed by 
Ben Stiller, also featuring Owen Wilson and Will Ferrell? Yes, as a matter of fact, I am. And I don't really know a lot about the glamorous world of male modeling, but I do know that collaborations work a lot better when everybody can fit inside the building. While they, while they could all fit in the building, there were a lot of buildings at Northwestern. There was the Technology Building, the Catalysis Building. There was, there was Ryan Hall, which was also nicknamed Nano. So people go to like Nano 104, but it, it, it wasn't a really like a tiny building that people couldn't fit in. Are you sure it wasn't really tiny? Like, do you think that Connor or his collaborators worked in Nano 104 and like, you know, they just don't make potential stats that small? Was that the problem? Or you know, do you think there's actually something else going on here? Probably something else. And maybe we should first define what, what is current density for the oxygen reduction reaction? Yeah, well, that's a good point. So when you're doing the oxygen reduction reaction, or ORR for short, you're reducing oxygen. Amazing, right? You know, I'm so good at just repeating the words in a definition to tell you what it is. I'll be here all day, folks. Wait, wait, wait a minute. It, it reduces oxygen to something not oxygen? That is correct. You have the same gift that I do. <laughs> Let's take this show on the road. Well, as it turns out, there are primarily two uh, not oxygen things that can be made from the ORR. And usually those are water or hydrogen peroxide. And one of those is good. And one is bad. One of them makes more current and one of them makes less. And so actually this is where the ring in that rotating ring disc electrode that you mentioned Connor and his collaborators are using, it's where it comes into play. Um, I'll let you describe that a little bit later, but getting back to the point about current density, what you're looking for as a researcher is the most current possible because current is just a fancy word for electricity and electricity helps you scroll Instagram for many hours. And listen to this podcast. More importantly, yes, listen to this incredible podcast. So the metric that's often used as a benchmark for ORR electrocatalysts is the current density and often at a specific potential. So like, for example, you can find these benchmarks here in the United States. It's often set by our uh, Department of Energy. And to the best of my knowledge, it's something like based on 2021, like 25 milliamps per centimeter squared at like 0.9 volts, something like that. So now what this means is you're measuring that Instagram and podcast running current but you also need to know the area of your electrocatalyst because current density, as the unit suggests, is basically dividing current by surface area. So, so now that we know what current density is and, and why it's so important, we now need to think about why Connor's collaborators have 63% higher current density than Connor. Right. So what do you think could be the reason? So one thing it, it might have to do with Travel. I, I do wonder, like, if travel needed to, if Connor needed to travel, like, to another state or another country for this t collaboration, because typically you don't, like, send a person out for a week. Like, so I'm imagining that Connor traveled to this lab, dropped some non precious metal electrocatalysis knowledge, and then bounced. And it's not uncommon that there might be some knowledge, some experimental details that Connor mastered over his years of doing electrocatalysis and his development that just can't be taught in just one short week. And now those details are playing out in the discrepancy between the uh, just between their uh, their current density data. Yeah, this is absolutely a possibility. And, you know, not to claim that, like, we know everything about electrochemistry, but honestly, how many times do we get phone calls at our job or emails from customers? And, there, you know, there's just some things you can't really explain or, like, you just have to suffer through and learn through experience in the lab. Like, this is probably a longer conversation to be had, but I think many researchers just want quick answers when the real solution is, you got to bang your head against the wall for a while, and then you'll gain that irreplaceable experience and knowledge. Yeah, the, the intuition about what's going on in your system. Sometimes we get customer calls about some random electrochemistry problem, which, which could be caused by a number of just various different issues. But usually we're able to guess the problem relatively quickly because we've got the experience, we've got the intuition. Now, Connor's got intuition and experience about the system that the collaborators don't. And so it's hard for the collaborators right now to figure out what the problem is. So then what you're saying here is you think we're, we're pretty settled that, you know, the error is with the collaborators and not with Connor. I assume that you mean that this, you know, 63% higher 
current density that the collaborators are getting, that's the one that isn't right. Yes. In this case, I am making the assumption because Connor has done this for a much longer period of time. He's probably done more ORR experiments with more consistent results, and he's probably rationalized why his value for the current density is relatively accurate compared with his collaborators. But this this is just an assumption. Okay. So then I guess before we go any further, trying to figure out you know the cause of this current density discrepancy here, we should probably just go over some basics and you know describe what RRDEs are. Yeah, that's a, that's a good idea because not not everybody listening might be familiar with it. So let me try to describe what an RRD is, and 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 hopefully this this makes sense because we're on a podcast. It's hard, you know, try to visualize this. So a rotating ring disc electrode, or RRDE for short, is used for hydrodynamic electrochemistry, or, or simply put, hydro meaning water or just some kind of electrolyte, and dynamic involving motion. So basically, we are rotating this electrode tip, which makes a vortex in solution. Imagine one of those Category 5 tornadoes, you know, throwing cows through the air like in Twister, but it's in solution and it's it's less violent. Rotation rates can be around like 400 to 3,600 RPM rotations per minute. So so pretty fast. Wait, did, did you just reference 1996 American epic disaster film Twister based on a screenplay by Michael Crichton and Anne Marie Martin starring Bill Paxton and Helen Hunt? Yes, I did. But I, I actually never saw the movie. I just remember the flying cows in the trailers. I remember actually seeing this movie when it came out. And I think the worst part of Twister was that it created a generation of posers who suddenly thought <laughs> they were tornado <laughs> expert meteorologists or something. The next the next news story that mentioned some tornado in Oklahoma, everyone at my school would be like, oh, that's an F9005 tornado with aggressive wind speeds. Like, dude, shut up. You don't know anything about tornadoes, just like me. Do you, do you also walk into the bank and start telling all the you know workers how they should diversify their investments better because you watched Wolf of Wall Street? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to think like... Was there a movie that like really inspired me into my particular profession? You know, now that you mentioned, I did have a brief stint as an undercover sunglasses wearing alien fighter in the late 1990s after I watched Men in Black. <laughs> well, at least you didn't tell me you wanted to be a plumber after seeing the Super Mario Brothers movie, specifically the 1993 Super Mario Brothers movie. No, no, no I didn't. But I did get the sudden urge to learn martial arts, uh, you know, from New York City sewer rats. Spoiler alert! It didn't. It didn't go well. That's not Super Mario Brothers. That's Ninja Turtles. Oh, oh well. What, again, Super Mario, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. What's the difference? The original Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movie from 1990 was good, and I've I've seen it as a kid and as an adult, and I still think it's amazing. Come on, Jose Canseco, bat. Tell me you didn't pay money for this. Alex, do you even know who Jose Canseco is? Not until you tell me about it before we record the podcast. <laughs> I quit breaking the fourth wall. <clears throat> but my favorite Jose Canseco play of his career, for those who uh, aren't aware, he was a famous professional baseball player. For everyone who, like Alex before five minutes ago, also didn't know, my favorite play of his career, <laughs> this is a true story. He, he was uh, an outfielder, okay, and this guy hits a fly ball. He's running to get it, and it bounces off of his gigantic steroid-infused head and goes over the wall for a home run. Such a legend. <laughs> but would you pay money for a Jose Canseco bat? You know, only if I can use it to beat up a fully grown mutant turtle humanoid wearing a red bandana and a trench coat. Remember, they're, they're technically teenagers. Uh, okay, so <laughs> then only if I can use it to beat up a teenaged mutant turtle humanoid wearing a red bandana and a trench coat. Let's make it happen. I'll check eBay for the bat. You go find the turtle. Now, now that I think about it, how would turtles do in a rotating disc system? I feel like they would be pretty resilient to the vortexing, despite us, you know, describing it as a Category Five tornado from Twister. <laughs> I think you're right because, you know, unlike RRDEs, turtles are good swimmers, and you know, I think the worst that would happen is that like the turtle shell crashes into the ring disc electrode from the vortex motion, and they ruin the experiment. Hey, maybe that's what happened to Connor's collaborators. They've been adding turtles to their RRDE experiments. Yeah, add 25 grams of potassium chloride, 150 milliliters of deionized water, three Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, rotate at 2,500 RPM, and sweep the potential until shell destroys electrode. <laughs> this was clearly written in someone else's lab notebook. Wink, wink, for those who listened to the previous podcast. Yeah, I see what you did there. <laughs> 
But before we jump ship to another crappy early '90s movie, <laughs> I, I think uh, I think you were trying to describe RRDs or something. Uh, right, right. We were describing what an RRD is. So an RRDE tip has a disc and a ring, and they're both working electrodes. The ring and the disc are concentric, and there is a gap between the two. So in this RRDE experiment, the electrode spins, causing that motion of fluid towards the disc and the ring. Fluid hits the disc first, which is radially, radially centered, and then it flows outward and hits the ring second. The benefit of this geometry is that you can do some kinds of electrochemistry on the disc, in Connor's case, the oxygen reduction reaction, and then another kind of electrochemistry at the same time on the ring. This is also sometimes called a generate-collect experiment because you can generate something on that disk and then detect it or collect it, air quotes, on the ring once it makes its way there. Right. And it's also important to note that not everything that's generated at the disk makes it to the ring. And this is where the concept of uh, collection efficiency comes in, if you've ever heard this term. Collection efficiency is basically the measure or percent of stuff generated at the disk that makes it to the ring. And then you also normalize for the number of electrons transferred. But generally speaking, a higher collection efficiency means more stuff from the disk makes it to the ring. And it turns out the collection efficiency is based completely on the geometry of the disk and the ring. And this is like a super complicated equation, describes collection efficiency just based on the geometry of the disk and the ring. So it's it's based on geometry, but like practically speaking, because you know, nothing's like a perfect ring or a perfect circle, there there are ways that you can measure it. You need to you really want to measure the collection efficiency, and to do this, it's you just take some easily oxidized or reduced molecule, and you do a kind of generate collect experiment that we just talked about. So if you oxidize the species at say the disc, then you would reduce it on the ring. And basically, the ratio of the current that you see, the current between the disk and the ring, is equivalent to the experimentally measured collection efficiency. Now, normally, this should be close, but not exactly equal to the theoretical geometric value. Right. And now, in the case of Connor here, doing ORR, like I mentioned before, there are two things that can be made from the reduction of oxygen, and one of them being good, one of them being bad. Now, the good one, which is water, will make its way from the disc to the ring, and then nothing's going to happen. It's just water. Water goes over the ring, and you don't notice it electrochemically. But the bad one, which is hydrogen peroxide, if it's produced and then makes its way from the disc to the ring, it can be detected. And so this is because the ring in these RRDE tips is made from platinum. And platinum is great at a lot of different reactions, including both ORR and detection of peroxide as an unwanted ORR byproduct. So as you, as you listen to this, you can visualize that both Connor and his collaborator have a glassy carbon disc electrode, and then their non-precious metal electrocatalyst is deposited on the glassy carbon disc. And then there's this platinum ring around the disc. This whole electrode assembly is then put into solution, oxygen is bubbled in, and as we apply a negative potential to the disk electrode, we are reducing oxygen into water and peroxide. So this is just to give you a sense, you can kind of visualize this in your head, about what's physically happening in this system. And so that means that this discrepancy you mentioned at the beginning between their measured current densities, assuming both Connor and his collaborators agreed to use the same mass and area of iron something, electrocatalyst, whatever they're doing, <laughs> then that discrepancy is coming only from the disk electrode current. Correct. The, the disk electrode current from the collaborator is 63% higher than that of, of Connors. And based on what we've learned from the troubleshooting tests that they've performed, they are using the same mass, area, iron, whatever, electrocatalyst. So in principle, they have checked off all the things that could be contributing to a higher current density. All right, well, that solves it then. The only answer is that iron something or other behaves differently depending on which geographical location it's in. This is real cutting-edge science. <laughs> no, no joke. Reproducibility between labs is so difficult. I think we've both experienced a lot of this in graduate school. It's amazing researchers 
ever get reproducible results, but but sometimes there can be differences in technique that we mentioned. You know, this is half science, half arts and crafts in a way. Honestly, it's just like baking. I always think about baking like part like cooking, part science. Probably because I'm a huge nerd and I you know think about science when I'm making banana bread. I I do enjoy baking, and to a degree, there's a lot of science in the in the measurements, but but when it comes to kneading bread. I feel like there's some serious technique and effort that's not easily reproducible, you know? Um, did you know that there is a profession known as, like, a master baker? Like, all they do is bake. That's it. And I was watching Masterclass on baking, and the technique involving, like, kneading, uh, like, these perfect loaves of bread is amazing. Like, my bread tastes good, but it doesn't always look like professionally made bread. Honestly, I don't think I've ever made real bread or even like kneaded bread dough that somebody else made. So I'll just take your word for it. And I probably should have clarified before, you know, when I say banana bread, it really means more like banana cake because <laughs> anybody who likes banana bread knows that the term bread is a very loose definition. It doesn't even have yeast in it. It's like a bread <laughs> imposter. Well, well, one time I actually had some salty banana bread and I can claim that it was less of a cake and more of a bread as we define cakes as being sweet and breads as being savory. Yeah, well, I, I would really more use the yeast or no yeast as the determining factor for bread. But, you know, then again, I'm apparently not a master baker. So what the heck do I know? All I really do know is that every time I end up baking and believe me, I'm I'm really not that good, so it's not too often, <laughs> thankfully. The worst part is the cleanup. I'm just, I'm extremely picky about getting my kitchen surfaces messy. I hate it. And so I'm always having to wipe down everything and like polish the stove from every spill and, you know, flour cloud that just gets absolutely everywhere. It drives me insane. Oh, you know what? I think, I think you're onto something. Are, are you pondering what I'm pondering? No, oh, I think so, but... How will we get three pink flamingos into one pair of capri pants? <laughs> oh, oh man, pinky in the brain. I, uh, I, I deserve that one. But, <laughs> but what I meant <laughs> was that the issue with current density has to do with polishing. In particular, platinum contamination from the ring getting onto the disc electrode during electrode polishing. Ah, I see. So it's not a baking thing, but you know, <laughs> probably the collaborators started polishing the glassy carbon disc and the platinum ring on their RRD tip at the same time. And so, you know, eventually some of the platinum being polished, you know, from the ring made its way to the disc. Yeah. And, and we know that platinum is a catalyst for ORR. So, so if there's platinum on the disc, then that could lead to a higher, you know, current, you know, I mean, Increased current is coming from the same reaction. So I'm feeling confident that this is a polishing issue. Uh, they could they could confirm this by doing something like XPS or XRD or some kind of elemental analysis technique on the glassy carbon disc. And if they see platinum, then I say, you know, case closed. Well, if they don't get platinum, then, well, misbehaving iron, what you might call it, is still a working theory. But, uh, well, I think you're probably right. So it means that they need to find a better way to polish their disc and ring electrodes. You know, maybe by going with, like, an RRDE tip that, oh, I don't know, lets you change the disc in and out so it can be polished separately. Like, you know, just like the fine set of change disc products offered by Pine Research, for example. It's just a random thing that popped into my head just now. <laughs> yeah, I think the ability to switch out the disc electrode and be able to polish the disc and the ring separately is critical. I mean, imagine all the ORR studies that could be suffering from platinum contamination. All this can be solved with a change disc electrode. Well, uh, that's enough uh, shameless uh, plug uh, for our products, but uh, thank you for listening. And now it's time to listen to more product plugs from our sponsors. Hi, Pine Research here for the Wave Vortex Electrode Rotator, the convenient and compact solution for all your RDE, RRDE needs. The Wave Vortex is not a lava lamp, but a sleek, powerful, and electrolyte whipping instrument that is revolutionizing the electrochemistry world. Just pop on your electrode tip, hop into the lab, and you'll be crushing that research in no time. It's as simple as pop, hop, and the fun don't stop. I'm out here in the Pacific Ocean, and the Wave Vortex is powerful enough that it's sucking up so much marine life 
I'm gonna have a seafood dinner for years! The secret is the hydro fluctuating knob where you can give it all the RPMs your experiment can handle. And then some. Just set it and forget it. Call now and we'll send you the Wave Vortex for just 394 easy payments of 1995. But through this exclusive podcast offer, we'll also send you absolutely nothing as a free gift. But we're not done. Call in the next 42 seconds and we'll quintuple your order. Don't hesitate. Start vortexing your way to a PhD today. Advertisement is a joke for comedy purposes and is not real, nor does it constitute an offer of any kind from Pine Research. Restrictions apply. See terms and conditions for details. Not valid in Alaska, Hawaii, any of the contiguous 48 states, or any country on any of the seven earthly continents, except Antarctica. Contact Pine Research for details, real offers, life advice, or product quotes. All right, everybody. We are going to play a very exciting game of Ecamm Abstract Mad Libs. So maybe you played Mad Libs when you were younger, like I did, but if you haven't, I will try to explain this game to you now. So a Mad Lib is a story with keywords removed, leaving blanks that need to be filled in. So example of blanks would be things like, you know, nouns, verbs, adjectives, numbers, stuff found in a car, you know, things in the same category as the blank, right? Okay, so the goal of the Mad Lib is to have somebody who is unfamiliar with the story fill in the blanks, but like blind, they don't know anything about the story or what the context is. Now, usually this results, hopefully, in something kind of nonsensical and hilarious. Um, today, we're going to play Ecamm Abstract Mad Libs using a fake electrochemistry abstract that I've created. And I'm going to ask my esteemed colleague, Dr. Alex Paroff here, for a series of chemicals and numbers and, you know, elemental prefixes, instruments, you know, things like that, right? Like electrochemistry things to fill out this abstract. Now, Alex has not heard this abstract before. He doesn't know what the context is of the blanks. He doesn't know what the topic is. Uh, and so once all the blanks are filled in, and I've asked him all of them, I'm going to read this ridiculous, hopefully, sounding abstract and story. So, Alex, are you ready? Yeah, let's do this. All right, all right. Here we go. Okay, I'm going to ask you for a bunch of these in a row, and you just tell me the first thing that pops into your head. So, I need okay. an adjective. An adjective. Um... Slimy. Ooh, slimy. This should be interesting. All right, another adjective. Another adjective. Um, thin. Ooh, I like it. It's it's different. It's different. Uh, <laughs> it's all right. Different uh, adjective. Uh, yes. All right. A gas. A gas. Um, uh, I'm gonna go with. Uh, I'm gonna go with neon. Neon. Very reactive. Very reactive. <laughs> very reactive gas. That's right. Uh, um, okay, uh, an element. An element. Cesium. Ooh, good lord. C e s. Yeah, cesium. Yeah, yeah. C e s i u m. Good. I got it. Uh, another element, please. Another element. Potassium. Potassium. I know how to spell that one. Just stick it to like one side of the periodic table. Yeah. And then the other side of the periodic That's, table. Yeah, it's all the alkali or alkali earth metals. Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, a prefix, like a, a, a scientific, you know, unit prefix. Oh, oh, yeah, so like uh, like milli or, yes, or yes. deca or something like that. Correct. Okay. Um, so let's do um, femto. Ooh, fem femto. Is there a P? No, just F T. Uh, uh, F. F E M T O. Yeah, yeah. -E I always think there's a P in there because it sounds like Femto. Yeah, you know? yeah. Fempt. I always want to put a P in there. Okay. Um, a beverage. Beverage. Uh, Sprite. Ooh, Sprite. <laughs> the lemon lime soda. Oh, if lemon soda. for some reason you're listening to this and I don't know if that's in every country, but anyway. Yeah. yeah. Sprite. I think, I think it is. I think, yeah, I think, yeah, so. I think so, I think but just in case. Yeah. Anyway. Um, a household appliance. Vacuum cleaner. Ooh, I love it. Vacuum cleaner. Okay. Uh, a another prefix. Same. Another same prefix. Um, mega. Let's go the mega. opposite. Mega. All right. Opposite, opposite direction. Of, I like it. Direction. All right. Uh, a number, and uh, I will I will preface by saying any number. Right. This could be positive, negative, uh, uh, scientific pref. You know, notation. Any number it doesn't have to be just like an integer. But yeah. it can be an integer. It it's up to you. Integer. Let's go with 5.72. 5.72. All right. Another number, please. Another number. Um, 
point five. Thirty eight point five. I'm like in the decimals mood today. I I, I can see that. It's because I it's because I said it could be an integer. So yeah. you're just you're just being a contrarian. Yeah, I'm just being a contrarian. <laughs> All right, uh, another prefix, please. Another prefix. Um, Oh, why are all the numbers like oh uh there's a lot of weird ones you know you try to think of the weird I, ones it's like well, well yeah yeah and they're all like because i'm always thinking about prefixes to uh for either increasing or decreasing the magnitude or something like that's that's what we're going for no yeah yeah um I, uh let's go let's go with kilo kilo all right uh a unit a unit henry's henry's Ooh. yeah those are for inductors. for inductors. That's yeah. right. Which are often meaningless. It's often meaningless. <laughs> 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 there's chemistry. There's a there's a bit of an inside joke for everybody. Uh, all right, I'm not going to apologize. All right, a number. <laughs> a number. Uh, let's go with uh, uh, five thousand eighty-two. Five zero eight two. Uh, another prefix. I know this is a bit redundant, but it's a scientific abstract. A scientific Get over abstract. it. Exactly. We have numbers and prefixes and units. All right. Yeah. A prefix, yeah. please. Prefix. Uh, giga. Giga. Got giga. it. Uh, uh, another unit. Another unit. Um, viscosity. So wait. Oh, oh no, no. Sorry. Is it sorry, pascals? No, no. Is that? Uh, what, is oh that the yeah. Unit? What is it? Uh, yeah, the unit of viscosity. The unit of viscosity. Oh, oh poise. Poise. Right, like millipoise. Millipoise. Oh, I just came up with that. I'm so proud of yes, myself. Thank poise. you. I'll do poise. I think right. I think that's the unit. Someone's gonna be like, "That's not the that's unit." Not the nah, unit. I'm a terrible <laughs> scientist, <laughs> but I'm going with poise for now. But I, I, that, that's a that's a unit. Um, a scientific technique. You know, like some characterization technique. Oh, something. characterization technique. Um, FTIR. FTIR. All right, another one. Another scientific another technique. Another scientific technique. Uh, <laughs> melting point analysis. <laughs> <laughs> That's excellent. Melting point analysis. Oh, good Lord. That is uh, that is interesting one. All right. A verb ending in ER. A verb ending in ER. Um, oh, man. I keep coming. Like, I just think runner. Uh, yeah. <laughs> runner. That's like that's like the most obvious one. <laughs> right? the most obvious one. Yeah, I'm yeah. like, yeah, that's the one that just comes to my mind. <laughs> is that what you're going with? Yeah, we're going with runner. runner. Got runner. it. Um, a material property. Hardness? Hardness. All right. A number. A number. Uh, uh, e to the 2.5. E to the 2.5. Okay. <laughs> That's very specific. Yeah. All right. A prefix. A prefix. <clears throat> prefix. All right. This is the last prefix. This is I the promise. Last prefix. That's right. Um, how about just uh, micro, micro? Micro. Yeah. Don't. Yeah. Don't. Uh, there's. There's so many. There's, there's only so many. Prefixes. I feel like there's a lot of them that are like at the extreme ends of big and small. That you know, you, you're, yeah. you're like, oh, I wish I, like, I don't. You know, I can't think of them at the moment. Like the funny. What, what would be really funny, or you know. <laughs> For the moment, but uh, but that's fine. So yeah. okay, let's. Uh, where am I at here? We've got an adjective. Fluffy. Ooh. Fluffy. That's definitely going to play a role in an electrochemistry <laughs> abstract. <laughs> yeah. All right, we have like four or five more here. A gas. Okay. A gas. Another gas. <laughs> let's go with argon. Argon. Oh, also a very reactive gas. <laughs> All right, uh, a number. A number. Actually, I need three numbers. So give me three numbers. Three numbers. Yeah. Okay. Uh, 280. 280. Uh, 1,591. 1,591. And then, uh, seven. <laughs> seven. Seven. All right. And the last one I need from you is a liquid. A liquid. Um, uh, how about, uh, what is it? DMSO? Yeah, DMSO. 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 Dimethyl sulfoxide. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. that's the one. Okay, so before I read this amazing abstract, I do want to give a brief uh, credit that this is a made-up abstract. However, I did take some inspiration, let's say, in some of the, I don't know, wording or some of the, you know, uh, details from this publication. That's It's entitled Electrocatalytic Hydrogen Oxygen excuse me, electrocatalytic hydrogen evolution reaction on edges of a few layer molybdenum disulfide nanodots. And uh, it looks like the corresponding author is uh, Pagona Papa Constantinou. So I just wanted to give this shout out here. Uh, just, it is obviously not exactly that abstract, but I want to give credit where it is due. 
um, in some regards. So thank you for uh, that publication uh, back from 2015, uh, if you happen to be listening. Uh, and uh, here we go. Here is the... And prepare to have it butchered. Yes, and prepare to have it absolutely <laughs> blown away with amazingness, yeah. is, is what you should say. Yeah. So this is the water-splitting, <laughs> uh, sort of, uh, Ecamm Abstract uh, Mad Lib... Uh, here we go. Okay, here we go. <laughs> I don't know what else to say about it. Okay. The design and development of slimy, highly thin electrochemists for neon production <laughs> underpins several emerging clean energy technologies. In this work, for the first time, cesium potassium femtodots <laughs> have been synthesized by sprite assisted grinding exfoliation of bulk platelets and isolated by sequential steps using a vacuum cleaner. <laughs> Forget about the continuity here. The yeah. megadots have a thickness of up to 5.72 layers, which is around 38.5 kilohenries, <laughs> and an average lateral size smaller... <laughs> Oh, no. An average lateral size smaller than 5,082 gigapoise. <laughs> oh, that's really Whoa, good. What does that oh, man. Mean? Uh, uh, that's a size of gigapoise. Yeah, size don't, of gigapoise. yeah, don't think too hard. Okay. <laughs> Detailed structural characterization was conducted via FTIR and melting point analysis <laughs> <laughs> using a Pine Research Wave Runner instrument. See, that one's actually close. That's actually close. It's pretty close, except a Wave Runner is like that thing that you. Right in the ocean, right? Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, so right. we make we make like jet skis now. Yeah. Apparently, this is amazing. This is awesome. Wave runner. Yeah, which established that the electrocatalyst retained its hardness even after calcination at e to the point two two point five degrees Celsius. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the small lateral size and reduced number of layers provided these micro dots. They're now micro dots <laughs> with p plentiful fluffy sites. <laughs> For the catalysis of the argon evolution reaction <laughs> in acidic electrolyte. <laughs> These electrocatalysts exhibited good durability and a taffel slope of, see, this is like almost accurate, 280 millivolts per decade. I mean, that's like, too, too, that's too large, but it's like, yeah. you know, it's not like four trillion. So, yeah. See, every so often in these Mad Libs, there's like an answer that kind of makes sense. And that's part of the fun. <laughs> see, this is, this is also very accurate with an estimated onset potential of 1591 volts versus rhe yeah that's very this is that kind of high super accurate i don't know super what you're talking accurate. about which are considered among the best values achieved in the literature <laughs> <laughs> it is proposed that this work may provide a simplistic route to synthesize a wide range of seven dimensional materials <laughs> <laughs> that yes. have applications in DMSO splitting <laughs> and other energy-related technologies. DMSO splitting. DMSO splitting. And the argon evolution reaction. The argon evolution. That's the AER. It's closely related to the HER and the OER. Wait, but wouldn't it, wait, but wouldn't it be like A-R-E-R? Uh, yeah. Our 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 guys the H E R and the O E R and the our the the argon evolution reaction yeah that's that's just straight up alchemy yeah like if <laughs> yes, you if you right. go if you go to a higher potential than the oxygen evolution reaction you just start evolving argon yeah somehow <laughs> don't even ask how it just happens nuclear reactions yeah that's however it. many more like whatever like protons and neutrons that are needed to turn oxygen into argon you know it just does it isn't it it's it's higher than, is it lower than that argon uh, it's higher I we should to, know this i we're, should look at a periodic table we're chemists we should definitely yeah. know this but the point is that um this is a, an absolute dumpster fire and, <laughs> and i'm i'm very pleased yes <laughs> <laughs> oh my yeah gosh. you need you know, mm, hmm, actually E to the 2.5 degrees Celsius. Let's see, argon, atomic number is about 18. Yeah, it's higher than that. Oxygen is 8. Hydrogen is yeah, yeah. 1. So, see, it does require more neutrons and protons. Yeah, this is like this is like chemistry 101 trying to you know bring back some of these things. I should know this better uh, off the top of my head. And, uh, and, we, uh, need, you know. we need peroxide to undergo like a nuclear reaction. And then we form argon. <laughs> and then we form argon. That, that's it. We have just uncovered a new form of emerging electrochemistry. 
And with that, we're going to conclude this amazing episode, <laughs> this amazing game here. So thank you all very much, and we'll see you next time on the Electrochemistry Podcast.